what I want to, I know we, uh, we're a little late today getting started because of Rosh Chodesh. And um, I'm debating, well, what I think we're going to do, um, our, last, last week, a couple of us were talking uh, after Minion, and Art raised, and afterwards Art raised a question, which I think uh, is worthy of discussion. Um, and what I'm thinking now is it might take us uh, a couple of weeks uh, to get into it. And well, let me read you his question, and then. Um, Or Art, do you want do you want to uh, do you want to say what the question is, or should I read it from your email? Um, <clears throat> I, I don't care. It's up to you. I can I can give a brief uh, summary of it, or if you want to read what I wrote, uh, I, I'm not sure the email uh, is the best statement of it. But I, I can you want me to reduce it to about two sentences. It wasn't, well, it's about three, but it's okay. Okay, well, well what I asked, and, and this was a result of uh, Rabbi Abe sending out a note about um, how it was you know, pretty painful to him. He hadn't used an electronic device in 25 years, and it was a difficult decision. And, and I, I've always, I've never had any problem using electronic devices on Shabbos. I, I respect those who don't. I don't send emails to people who who don't, um, but it seemed to me that um, that there was there's some it's it's misguided and there's some hypocrisy here. I, I, I don't mind at all. The I, I'm very happy that we where you can zoom in and we can use this. But um, I've always said that the problem uh, getting new members in is not how to get is not how do you get them in, but what's keeping them out. And, and I've always thought that one of the things that keeps people from joining a synagogue is all of the, the do not rules, do not do this, do not do that. And, and my question, since we, we've kind of gotten rid of this, this you know, electronics on Shabbos for the sake of coming to, uh, to services, is if it's okay not to do it, then why have it in the first place? Uh, and, I, and I use as an example, I mean, kidney oat was another example uh, in other religions, you know, P Catholics not allowed to eat meat on Friday for so long. And what happened to all those Catholics burning in hell now that it's okay uh, to eat meat on, on Friday. So I, I, I would simply ask the question, why do we have these rules in the first place if they're really, you know, in, in, ter in light of certain circumstances, not really that important. Is that a fair statement of what I wrote to you, uh, Mort, or did I say well, it? Well, it's your statement, so you, you think it's a fair statement. No, I mean, is that, is that, because I mean, you're, you're basing these sessions on what I said, and I, that's what no, I'm I, I'm still basing it on what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that's what I, you know, and I was I, a little bothered by that, again, not by using electronics on Shabbos, but just by how we, how we, this was so important to us, and, and I'll just say very quickly, the, the, the example um, that I used when we were, Janet, my wife Janet and I were invited uh, to Morton Carmi's for Shabbos dinner once, and Janet said, can I bring my knitting? And I said, I don't think so. And she said, why not? I'll be really discreet. No one, I said, I, I think it falls into one of the 39 categories of work you can't do on Shabbos. And she said, yeah, you're kidding. And I said, well, bring it with you and we'll ask there'll be knowledgeable people there and we'll ask. So we went up and she brought her knitting and, and this, I think Rella was there and uh, other people and we brought up the question. Everyone said, no, you can't knit. And, <clears throat> and it had nothing to do, that had nothing to do with Shabbos. It was, you just don't knit at somebody's house when you're invited for dinner. No, it had, it was all Shabbos. It was all Shabbos. <laughs> Janet, kidding, kidding. She's a good knitter right now. <laughs> you know that. But, but, um, and having, uh, having been trained in the law, I immediately gravitate toward, you know, where's the hypothetical that, that just blows this out of the water? And the one I came up with was, what if somebody is knitting sweaters or blankets for the homeless 
it's not a matter of life and death because it's not the middle of winter, but it's, you know, there's a chill in the air. So it would have been, it'd be nice. But the only time she can do it is between Friday sundown and Saturday sundown. So does it make sense? Does it make sense to, uh, to say, no, you may not, you may not knit. That's the reform <laughs> argument that halacha is outmoded and doesn't, no longer applies to us. And so we don't have to do it. And Trump halakha is, is fine. I mean, you know, it, I, I think this is not so much this halakha that comes from scripture and this halakha that is, that is the layers of rabbinic interpretation. And I'm just questioning those layers of rabbinic interpretation. I think guidelines uh, is, don't work on Shabbos. Don't work on Shabbos. And uh, here are some guidelines of things that you might not want to do. But to have, right. go ahead. Okay, I, I, let me jump in here. Uh, I, I think you are asking about five questions at once. Um, the first one, the first one that uh, you brought up was uh, why people do or do not come to shul. Um, okay. I, if if we want, we could discuss that briefly today. Is that raising your hand or reaching up for a shelf? Oh, I'm, I'm reaching up. No, no, no. Thank you. Reaching <laughs> up for a light. Okay. Um, you know, and, and frankly, um, I, I will just answer that part um, just by briefly quoting Rabbi Stone. Um, we had a religious committee several years ago where we were talking some practice, but it's, it's irrelevant now what we were talking about. Um, but he, he says, you know, we're asking the wrong question. He says, you know, what we do or do not do uh, at, at services in terms of uh, we say this or don't say that or whatever is irrelevant in terms of why people come to shul or don't come to shul. Um, that's a whole separate study. Frankly, um, if you want, we can talk a little bit about that now. But I'm, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of research been done on that lately, especially since there's such a drop off among people. Uh, you know, most population studies lately are finding more and more Jews uh, answering questions on, uh, you know, how Jewish are you as being. Uh, Jewish of no religion or, you know, no observance or, you know, in that area. So I think that's a very complex question. Um, and it has nothing to do with what we do at Davening or what we, or whether we can knit or not. Um, it's also the question of how, how we look at the uh, whole issue of, of, of our acceptance of halacha uh, in, in, in its various forms. I think that question is in there. Uh, the question of how do we decide uh, what electronics we can use on Shabbat or not is in there. Uh, the use of electricity and, and a few others. So, you know, just starting off with those three questions, and I'm, I think there was a couple more that I had that when I was thinking about this before, but didn't write down, so now I don't remember because, you know, I'm getting too old for this. Um, and um, so do we want to talk about why people do or do not come to shul or should I jump into how we look at halacha? How many, we how many weeks are you going to cover these things? And as many as we need. <laughs> it's up to you. Okay. Given, given that uh, rousing reaction, let me go to this. Um, this chart comes from a book that I happen to find on my shelf called Conservative Judaism, Our Ancestors to Our Descendants by Elliot Dorff. Hmm. Uh, anybody from, familiar with Elliot Dorff? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You know, besides the fact that he originally comes from Philadelphia, and I think one of his kids still lives in the neighborhood here. Um, 
I'll tell you my claim to fame with Elliot is that when we were in rabbinical school, we used to play football out in front of Grant's tomb every Shabbat afternoon. Uh, I don't know if everybody realized it. Uh, the seminary is 122nd in Broadway and Grant's tomb is 122nd in Riverside. It's a, a short block away. Uh, and a bunch of us used to go out there on Shabbat afternoon and play football. And uh, of course, the two players that were always chosen last, last were Elliot and myself. Elliot went to one side and I went to the other. And um, we were the slowest guy, you know, that's the way it was, you know, whatever. It, it did not, it did not damage our, uh, our egos, uh, either of us for all these years. Uh, but in any event, we used to have on our, on my team, what we called the dwarf play and that one of the bigger guys would block Elliot and then I would be free and run around to everybody and then they weren't paying attention to me because I was the last guy to be picked and then I would get the pass and score the touchdown. Um, but that, having that aside, that's, you know, it's just because you know, we've been in a weekend of reminiscing about those kind of days. Uh, you know, we had a big family gathering yesterday. Uh, but anyway, Elliot wrote this book back in the 70s, uh, mid, mid uh, 70s, I think it actually came out in 77. And it was, um, it was meant as a, uh, a book to be used uh, with uh, confirmation classes, uh, teaching them what is conservative Judaism. And he, uh, at the beginning of the book, he presents this chart. Like nowadays, I guess we would call it a spreadsheet, right? But back then, it was just a plain, ordinary chart in the book, where he lays out, let me see if I can show you the, uh, the uh, headings here, where he lays out different approaches to Judaism. Well, Orthodox, he breaks up conservative into to four different categories and uh, and adds and reform. And if you notice conservative four, uh, which has asterisk reconstructionist tendencies, uh, today we would not call it conservative four, we would just call it, uh, I, I guess we have to now say reconstructing Judaism. Mm -hmm. Isn't that their official name now? Yes. But anyway, that's, that was, uh, you know, you can see Mordecai Kaplan is in there, and that's, you know, basically their underpinnings. Uh, so he breaks it down here into the exponents of the approach, the method of study, nature of revelation, authority of Bible's laws and ideas, and man's ability to change the Bible's laws and ideas. So I think this, this to me, really gets to Art's question, you know, as to why do we have it in the first place? Um, and we have to say, I, I want to start off by saying that, that um, a society has to have some system of laws, some system of governance, um, whether people, um, you know, abide by these laws voluntarily uh, or whether they do it uh, under penalty of uh, whatever the police force wants to uh, impose. Um, you know, and we have to do it. It's enforced. Uh, I came up with an example, you know, uh, that I thought would help us to see this, what I'm talking about. Um, when we drive, what side of the street do we drive on? Right. 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 Why? Why do we do that in the first place? It's custom. It's law also now. So we don't crash into the guy coming towards us. Okay. Uh, why don't we drive on the left? That's just custom. 
That's Maybe. that started as custom. Did it? It would be dangerous. Oh, I think it was probably against the British. <laughs> <laughs> To make they, it rode their, they rode their horses on the left side. Yes. Why? Actually, driving on the left goes back to the days of the, what is it, the medieval jousts? You know, when, when the, uh, you know, when you're riding your horse holding the lance in your right arm going against the guy who's coming at you with also holding a lance in your right arm so you have to ride on his left uh it's coming out of that but in any event somewhere along the line it was decided that in some countries you drive on the left some countries will drive on the right for whatever reasons frankly i i didn't do any type of research to find out why uh, we just accept that's what we do uh, you got Great Britain, Japan, Thailand, uh, Australia. I don't know. I, I think I there was a fourth one that I remembered. Um, the drive on the left. Australia drives on the left. I'm sorry. Australia drives on the left. Australia. Yeah. Well, many of the uh, former British Empire countries will do that. Um, I remember back in the early 70s when the United States handed Okinawa back to Japan and before that that could happen they had to switch the whole country, the whole island of Okinawa from uh, driving on the right to driving on the left because as part of Japan everything in the country has to be uniform so they had to switch everything over which meant redoing every single, inter most intersections and all the on and off ramps of uh, expressways. Um, but in any event, that, that's a, a, a custom and a practice that developed uh, because at the time there was reason to do it. Um, and we just keep it. We have no reason to change it, frankly. Um, Halasa, I think, works in the, in the same way. Um, conservative Judaism has two slogans that we like to quote, and we've quoted over the years. Um, the first one was Tradition and Change, which is actually was a title of a book that came out, uh, I believe uh, in the late 60s, written by Mordechai uh, Waxman, who was a rabbi in, uh, on Long Island. Great Neck. In Great Neck. Mm -hmm. um, and became the uh, I don't want to say the Bible of, a, of conservative Judaism, but certainly a, uh, uh, a very important book. Um, you know, and his, his, he posited the premise that conservative Judaism is a way of um, holding on to tradition, holding on to the basics of tradition, but allowing modernity to come in and affect the way we live our lives and the way we approach different halachic concerns. Um, that in turn, I think, uh, led to the situation which uh, comes up with the different versions of conservative uh, Judaism that uh, Elliot has on this chart, which led, then led to the second catchphrase, unity and diversity. Uh, that we could all agree on different uh, valid ways of approaching the observance, uh, which may or which may conflict and differ from each other, but we could be unified under a common thread of what it means to be conservative. At that point, it could also mean you're conservative because you're not orthodox or you're not reformed. Um, and, and that would held on pretty well for a while. Um, but the guy, a lot of the guiding principle behind this is that halacha is in flux. Uh, halacha always has, uh, over the centuries, has always been able to, um, shall, shall I say, go with the flow. Uh, the question is, how strong was the flow? Um, and um, 
if we look at these different um, these different lines, uh, sometimes the flow is strong, sometimes it's weak, um, and sometimes uh, it's stagnant, uh, but not too often. Uh, so let's go on this chart. We start with the orthodoxy. Um, these uh, names here, Berkowitz and Lamb, are some of the um, writers of, you know, at least back in the 60s and 70s, people who were, uh, did a lot of writing. By the way, uh, that's Norman Lamb. Uh, I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's familiar with him. He was the president of Yeshiva University, passed away about two weeks ago. Yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure who uh, Berkowitz is or was. So the- Oh, yes, there Berkowitz. He was uh, a big guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but clearly, I think what uh, Elliot's referring to here is what uh, we, we now would call modern orthodoxy. Um, that uh, the Hasidim and the um, what we would call any part of the ultra orthodox uh, would not don't necessarily they in a general way would come under here, but they take things a lot to a lot bigger extreme. Um, actually, let me just point out one example. Um, I, yesterday, you know, we. Uh, we were going through our wedding pictures and it was our anniversary yesterday. And I was pointing out to my grandchildren and my children too, I think to a certain extent who didn't remember it, that when Carmen and I got married at an Orthodox school in Los Angeles, uh, we had mixed seating. Uh, we had mixed dancing and everything else. You know, there was no question that there should be any consideration of, uh, you know, of machitza at any sort. Um, and um, I at one point asked one of the cousins, not yesterday, but I had asked uh, one of Carmi's uh, cousins who's very active, was one of the beginners of Aisha Torah. Um, and I said, why is it that uh, orthodoxy has become so strict in these things? Uh, and he says, it's a clearly reaction to all the other uh, strains of Judaism getting more loose. You know, as we got looser, they got stricter. And now they have, uh, you know, mechitzas at weddings and whatnot. But anyway, orthodoxy makes no distinction between Peshat and Jerash. Right? That means if they look at a study, everything has uh, equal weight. Um, the, the text is understood with the use of traditional commentators and other uh, sources that you could put to it. So therefore, their nature of revelation is that the Torah, including both the written and oral traditions, were, were the exact words of God, and he gave it to everybody at one piece at Sinai. That's why uh, as soon as the law was getting it, given at Sinai, it needed um, some interpretation and, act, and applications, which um, reading into the Torah, you can say, you know, it said people came to Moshe with, the, uh, with all sorts of questions. And then Yitro was the one who said to him, you're driving yourself crazy. Um, why don't you save yourself just for the hard questions? and?" teach other people some of the basics of the law, they can answer the easy ones, and uh, you don't have to be involved in it. But anyway, the written and oral law were both transmitted at Sinai. They both have equal status in terms of the termination of what halacha is. Um, the authority is it's because it's God's will, and man's ability to change the biblical law is none since God revealed the answers to all future questions at Sinai, and man does not know more than God, um, which we could say, therefore, that uh, 
God knew, God knew that at one point we would have COVID and, uh, and how to handle Zoom on Shabbat. Uh, the exceptions were the applications to new situations, which were also revealed at Sinai. Choice of, choice of one position in the codes over others. In other words, you know, you have Hillel and Shammai who disagreed and a lot of other different rabbis uh, who also um, disagreed with each other. Uh, and therefore we have the ability to choose one or the other. Okay, um, I see right now it's about 10 after nine. Um, do, uh, do we have time to keep on going or should I perhaps uh, break at this point and see you next week? Mort, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So what's always troubled me is this notion that um, traditional commentators, it's almost as if everything they say, well, everything they say is, is law effectively or their view of the law, but there's, there's, there's no, there's an, I guess a presumption that nobody can, can do the same thing that those rabbis did at those times, as if all interpretation effectively stopped and they get credit as if it's revealed at Sinai and now it's not. I mean, what? I um, I'm When not did sure. everything stop? I'm not sure I can defend that because uh, I'm, I've never bought into that either. No, right. uh, but the um, fact is everything, I don't think everything did stop. Um, there are still people who are ruling and making commentary on things. For example, uh, I went to a, a, a Lower Marion there was a three-day Orthodox um, meeting on how to handle gay, lesbian uh, congregants. And they, they tried really hard to make exceptions or to reinterpret halacha in order to um, make it more acceptable to have uh, gay, lesbian relationships within, within the Orthodox community. And so I, from what I see on a small, very, very, very slow movement scale, they are still attempting to reinterpret things. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it, you're right, Chaim. Um, and, and that's why I would, um, I would preface that by saying this was at Lower Marion, which is, which is very strongly into the camp that we would say is modern orthodox. And, and modern orthodoxy is struggling with many issues. Uh, I don't know if struggling is the right word. Let me just say dealing with, other, with a lot of issues, um, you know, gay, lesbian, uh, role of women, um, you know, other, other issues that we have dealt with over the years and trying to say how does that fit within orthodoxy. I will say though that the difference that orthodoxy has is that they have to fit it in. Whatever they come with, they have to be able to find justification within the given uh, body of, uh, of literature, uh, you know, be it oral or written law. Um, and, and, you know, has to be able to, to uh, safely fit into to that, uh, that rubric. Um, I, I also maintain, and I, I tell my Orthodox cousins this all the time, mm -hmm. I said, the greatest thing that ever happened to Judaism was the printing press. <laughs> the worst thing that ever happened to Judaism was the printing press. Okay? And by that I mean that this development of halakha, uh, the, you know, the early, you know, the early, earlier commentators, um, the whole body of um, responsive literature that then follows that, you know, response to literature is somebody, you know, somebody like Art asks the question, um, gives it to, you know, rabbi, rabbi could either answer or give it to a Beitin or a yeshiva 
or to his Rebbe uh, and come up with how to answer that within a halakhic framework. Uh, that's still ongoing. Uh, we also have, you know, you know but I, I maintain that once works like the Shulchan Aruch were put in print, um, the Shulchan Aruch was the uh, was the attempt at at, at codifying is it codifying uh, all the halachic uh, practices at that point, uh, so people could and then as it, it was printed, and everybody the the idea was everybody would have a source to go to to find out what's going on. Well, first thing that happened is that um, everybody realized it was the Ashkenazic tradition and didn't reflect the Sephardic tradition. Uh, so there were glosses to the text that were added um, by Israelis. And uh, once they were added and printed in the, put in the printed editions, uh, this became the, uh, the document to go to when looking for uh, halakhic answers. So I'm, I maintain that that, in essence, put a stop or, or severely, um, I, th I think it was good in that it did do that. It said, okay, now we have a place where people can go and write to it. And it's bad in that it, it stopped the whole process of how we could have the give and take of looking at, at different approaches. Well, you know, because now it was, oh, you can't do that because the Shulchan Aruch says this, this, and this, and it goes against what you're trying to say. Um, so, therefore, it's the good and the bad. Um, I think, in, in general, to answer your question, David, is that I think the, the uh, orthodoxy took the approach that these earlier commentators were closer to the source and therefore could interpret it better. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, I just have to parrot what I see written. I may, I may be off, I may, there may be a whole lot of other things, but uh, you know, that's what they say. Uh, any other questions or? <clears throat> so that, that's exactly what my, my Orthodox friend said to me once we were having a discussion and he said, why do we question? Because the people who made those decisions, made those rules, they were they were there, and they knew what was you know what was going on. My my response to that was you know we didn't understand uh, the circulatory system until about the the sixteenth or seventeenth century. You know what did they know? What did they really know? But he said no, they were they were closest to it, and we shouldn't question because they were there. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, and what, you know, I, I don't know if I could add more to that. Okay. Um, are we good? Should we go on for a little while? I should stop, but if, this is Susan. I, I'm just saying I should stop. This is fascinating. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I need to go. Um, yeah, can we can we pick this up? Yeah, we can. We'll we'll pick this up next week. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. This is yeah, great. I, this is I knew. Great. I knew. Yes. Even if we would have started on time, we wouldn't have finished it today. Um, okay. The answer to Art's question is easy. Everybody picks and <laughs> what they do. I say again. I said the answer to Art's question is very easy. Everyone just picks and chooses, you know, you do what you want to do and you don't do what you don't want to do. Well, it's not, I don't think it's that easy because I think there are, there are you know, the, the idea of, uh, you know, tra tradition and change, um, there, is, there is value in tradition and, and I'm, I'm a big fan of tradition, uh, but I think there are distinctions between the kind of, uh, the kind of issues you face some some issues like whether you know women have to sit separately that has that has a pretty significant effect on certain people uh whether i in the privacy of my own home decide on shabbos to watch television or to sit down on my computer i don't think that has such a big effect on other people i think that's more a personal decision 
So I, I think, you know, in my mind anyway, there are there are these distinctions between the kind of issues you face and the kind of uh, decisions that should and should not be made by by rabbis. And you know, and and the the response to that, you know, that's the uh, that type of thinking I think has come up, you know, frequently, um, and that is if everybody is. Uh, it, actually, the phrase is, if everybody's making Shabbos for himself, um, where is our sense of community? Where do we come together as a community? And how do we even come together as a congregation? Um, and admittedly, you know, it's like Art says, you know, we, we have the ability or we feel, I mean, everybody has the ability to, when we're, in our own private, shall we say, our own private domain, uh, we can do what we want. Um, if Art wants to play with his computer on Shabbat, and if I want to use my timers on Shabbat, those are our choices. But yet, when we come together in community, uh, uh, whether that community is just, uh, what are there, 10 of us here right now, the 10 of us uh, you know, talking together, you know, allowing one person to talk at a time. Um, that's what we, you know, when we have to fall into community norms, you know, and then there has to be some type of, of decision is how do we establish those community norms? Um, these are all questions that we're not going to answer in two minutes, but I'm just saying that, that, Art's question leads into all these types of discussions. Yeah, what I'm saying is that I choose to daven at BZBI and not Young Israel, you know, and there's a reason why I don't daven at Young Israel. And um, so you, what, you're, what you're saying reminds me of what you already know, and that is that a Jew requires two people in order to define, you know, who he is. One who's more religious and he's the fanatic, and one who's less religious and he's the Epicurus, you know, so <laughs> yeah. we're all that way. And then there's that proverbial guy on the uh, stranded on an island when they right. pick up their two shoals. <laughs> you know, you know, That's the shoal I won't go to. <laughs> that, what he doesn't go to. Okay, uh, on that happy and cheery note, uh, you know, as, the, uh, as the people on TV used to do flash across the screen, to be continued. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, for the beginning of, Thank you for doing this. Enjoy yeah. the beginning of your 51st year together. How lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Ma Mazel tov, Mort. Do you inform me? Many more. Thank you. All right, Selkin. Okay. Bye. Thank you. See you soon. Good day, everybody. Bye. -bye.